Welcome back to the Outdoors Photography Podcast, where we share experiences out in the field and educate others through landscapes, wildlife, macro, and more with photographers from around the world. And in today's episode, we have Tyler Ficker on the show. He is a bird and wildlife photographer based out of Ohio, and uh, Tyler leads workshops and guided walks with Saber Wings Photo Tours and is an avid birder. So welcome to the show, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, start things off here. Um, tell us about what your spark birds were and uh, the moment you knew that birding was become a big part of your life. Oh, yeah. So I got into birding in the fourth grade. My my fourth grade teacher was doing a unit on all the different aspects of science in the southern Ohio region. So we talked about butterflies for a little bit. We talked about geology, all, all those good things. And it ended with a little unit on birds where every week we would learn four or five new birds of our area. And it was, it was fun, like I enjoyed it and everything, but it was nothing more than a, a collection for me. I always liked to collect things growing up, and so I, I was handed my first checklist, and I knew that once I saw something, I could check it off, and it was on to the next thing. The school year ended with a field trip out to Shawnee State Forest, which is a huge preserve in south-central Ohio, and I went out birding with the teacher during some of our free time. I was one of the only students that went out, and we were out in... He, he calls out a, a bird that I had never heard of before. It wasn't one of the ones we learned. And I could tell how, just how excited he was. And so I figured, oh my gosh, this has to be a new bird for him. Like, if he's this excited, he couldn't have seen this before. And so he shows me, and he's describing it, and he's like, it's a cardinal, but it's blue. And it ended up being a blue grosbeak, which at the time was a, mm. a very uncommon breeder here in southern Ohio. They've since become a little more numerous. And so I asked him if it was new for him, and he goes, no, I see these every year. He goes, I just love them that much. Like, look at how cool this thing is. And at that moment, I wouldn't say it was the first bird that got me into birding, but it was the moment that I knew that birding was more than just check it off and move on. It wasn't just a collection. It was these incredible animals right in front of us that we could repeatedly go out and enjoy over and over again, um, no matter how many times we saw them. And so I, I consider the bluegrass week to be my spark bird for that reason. And ever since then, I've it's awesome. It's kind of just uh, become part of my everyday life. I'm always always out looking at birds, even if I'm not going out for that reason. It's great. Yeah. So with the the blue grouse beak, do you do you still photograph it to this day, or did you kind of lose that passion, or are you still no, I, going after those early birds? Yeah. It oddly enough, it's one of the few species in my area I've not actually had a great chance to photograph yet. So not only is it something that I'm thrilled every single time I see or hear one. Um, it's still kind of that uh, that low-hanging fruit in the area. Like I know if I could just find an area that I could access them easy enough. Um, a lot of the ones that nest around here nest in either areas that you're not allowed to go walking off the trail, or they're not in not in public areas. A lot of my county doesn't have habitat for them, so I don't really come across them all the time. So it's still one I really would like to actually get out and photograph. That's a great way to put it with the origin story is just, you know, it's seeing the bird, but just the innate curiosity really of it. So like, what was really your feelings like in that moment, just seeing that bird? I mean, how were you seeing it up close through like binoculars or was it just yeah, like right in front through, of you? It was through binoculars, but it was still pretty much uh, completely filling the view. It was a nice, good view at it. I, I don't remember it in the detail that I would like seeing a bird now because at the time I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't know what sorts of things I was even supposed to be looking for. I mean, with the binoculars I used, it wasn't the greatest view in the world, but it was still there. I could still see the color on it. He was able, I was able to see it well enough that he described why it wasn't an indigo bunting, which was a bird I was familiar with at the time. And so it, it was it was a great look, and it was a very memorable experience. And I just remember feeling um, not only just in awe of what I was seeing, but just shocked that the people really went out and like enjoyed the same thing over and over and over again. It wasn't just you do it once, check it off, got to find the next one. So uh, there was a whole mix of emotions there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the cool thing about birding is that it's it's universal. I mean, like you said, it's people year after year can see the same birds, but it never truly gets old. And uh, you know, with birding, it's like it's very accessible. So, um, like you're saying, you can find them pretty much anywhere, even if you aren't setting out to look for them too. Right. Yeah. It, the only the only thing that's going to limit how how exciting a given bird is, is just your own mentality. If you actually take the time and watch the birds that your feet are over over and over again, you really look at them as something truly amazing, even if you see them all the time. 
that's how that's how you'll see them. That's how uh, common birds will stand out in whites you've never noticed them before. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, are you more of like a backyard birder? Or, I mean, how often do you travel to, like just for birding itself? Um, whether it's traveling just to a local park, or I would say I do that almost every single time I go birding, which is multiple times a week. But with my job as well as just um, for the free time that I have, I find myself traveling as often as I can to bird, trying to trying to get out of Ohio maybe once a month or so if possible, um, either for work or for fun. So I'm definitely the the traveling type of birder, but I do mm-hmm. I do enjoy a good backyard birding every now and then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you want to take us into kind of kind of your job and uh, what you do? Yeah. So I I was actually the one of the participants on the first ever trip that Saberwing Nature Tours ran back in 2014, and I I wanted to stay in contact with with the guy who owned the company. It was a very very new, very small company at the time. Obviously, it just started, and it turns out that he ended up being the field trip coordinator for the biggest week in American birding. So every year that I would go there, I would see him and the co-owner who also lived in the area, and so I would I would see them. I would just maintain connection with them, going into Going into, I believe it was my junior year of college, I would stayed in touch with them over those years, and I reached out and asked if they had any sort of intern internship opportunities, if they needed any help with office work. I just kind of wanted to learn what it was like to plan a trip. I was in a wildlife science degree, and I kind of wanted to just investigate all the different aspects of wildlife science, all the different types of things you could do. I had done field work, but I wanted to see a little bit of the ecotourism side. And so they said, we actually would like to have you come shadow a trip and see what it's like to actually work with participants and see what wildlife, um, like bird photography and birding, can have on an economy. So so I actually tagged along with uh, Brian Zwiebel, who's one of the co-owners of the company, and is an incredible, incredible bird photographer, up on a trip to Alaska. I shadowed him. They asked me to cover my way, and, I, and then they would let me get that experience. And then following COVID, uh, I graduated right into the start of COVID, so I wasn't really able to go do any field work or anything like I had originally planned. And so the owner, the two owners asked me if I would be able to help out doing some office stuff with them. Um, and then as things began to open up, they started having me uh, actually lead trips for them. So now I'm at the point where whether it's a um, birding trip or a bird photography trip, I'm one of the leaders that will that'll take clients anywhere in the country or in the world that they may be uh, may be interested in going providing not only the that's awesome providing not only the knowledge of the birds in the area the logistics kind of maintaining a smooth logistics on the trip but also on these photo tours providing the opportunity getting them in the best situation possible for the best opportunities uh, to photograph a given species with having the knowledge of of the of my camera and of their camera systems in a way that I can help them troubleshoot anything in the field and kind of give them a good basis for what settings they might want to be working with if they don't know how to do that themselves. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, you, you mentioned you do both birding and bird photography. Yeah. Um, what are kind of some of the differences you found between leading those two tours? You know, you talked about the placement, but some of the other differences right. there. Yeah, so so the way we run birding tours is going to be a lot more focused on the the specialty species of an area. So going out and trying to see as many species as possible, as well as possible, really focusing on those regional uh, specialties of the area. And so the goal is, the goal is, again, to just see as much as you possibly can in the time you're in a given location. And this does often end up providing a lot of good opportunities for people who carry cameras with them to get some good photos. However, our photo tours might be the type of area where we go spend a week in Costa Rica, might only see... 150 species, but we're going to really spend time making sure that we are there were in areas where the light angle, the the background, the perches, um, and everything are exactly how we want it, so that you can get the absolute best image possible. So it's a lot less focused on seeing as many of the species, um, but it's a lot more focused on spending quality time photographing the given targets of an area that are that are advertised for that area. Awesome. Yeah. And are you are you kind of more teaching there, or are you just um, kind of just placing them? Like, is it more of a workshop style, or it's definitely more workshop style. Um, but there, it's yeah, it's workshop style in the in the aspect that 
I'm leading them out in the field, and obviously I'm if we come across an opportunity and I know, oh, this, this bird's in this area and this is how it typically behaves, you guys are going to want to be here so you get the best photos. But also I'm working with them, telling, like, call it maybe calling out settings live as it's happening or helping people kind of predict the, the setting we're going to be into, going into it and giving them advice as to what I think maybe they want to have their camera set or what sort of things they want to be looking for. Or, hey, be careful if this bird flies up against the sky. The sky's really cloudy right now, so here's how you need to adjust your exposure compensation if it does so. Things like that, just kind of keeping, uh, keeping them focused on not only the opportunity presented in front of them, but how to how to stay on top of their camera and what sort of uh, settings and advice uh, I would have for them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I imagine with these photo tours, they probably take a lot of like effort and research beforehand. So, like, how much time do you really invest into like finding locations, scouting them out, and then getting that way uh, so that the guests can get the best photos possible from them? Yeah, so scouting scouting out an area and really planning the area, um, it it widely varies based on the location. <clears throat> if it's something like if it's something like uh, up in Barrow, Alaska, we. We've had guides go into that area for, I believe, 20 years now. Brian's been going up there since well before Saberwing was established. So he, so he really has, has a, an incredible understanding of the area. And so we spent some time going out beforehand for a few, for like a day or two, just kind of figuring out, okay, was, we know these birds are typically on this road, but here's the pond that they're nesting on this year, stuff like that, just so we have that kind of idea. An area like North Dakota when we do our, our prairie photography tours the terrain out in that area can change so much in a given year. Spots where I photographed chestnut collar long spur last year were having western greaves displaying on it this year. So it completely changes in terms of how much water or what the the grass height is at a given area. So that's the type of area where I might go out two, three days early, drive around, check on all my locations, make sure that if there's a species I don't know where it's at this year because site x is no longer available for them then i'll spend some time looking for a new one um but all all six of us at sabering we share all of our information whenever we're in an area to be able to benefit other tours and so we have a long database of what is typically where when certain uh, water levels are are at a certain height or things like that if it's an area like when i'm doing my southern ohio warbler photography workshops there's not a ton of scouting that really needs to go into that because it's, it's the area where I bird all the time anyway, so I I know where certain pairs of certain birds are going to be. I have territories of Kentucky warblers mapped out at maybe 10 different spots in the area, so I really have a good understanding of that area just because it's where I live. So yeah, again, it really, really varies widely depending on uh, the region. It depends on if we're using feeder setups for a lot of things. Uh, things like our Minnesota tours, our, our winter Minnesota photography tours, work with a lot of private landowners who have have feeder setups, and we have good connections with them, so we're able to use those over and over. So we do know things are going to be pretty consistent there. That's really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. You mentioned a little bit about like networking and connections with it. So like, how big is like the photo tour, like photography industry, and in, you know, in general, really? So there, there's quite a few people out there doing this type of thing. Um, really, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary because a lot of people are going to be hosting workshops in maybe the areas where they live where they're going to know things the best, and so they might have a specialty, and people are going to come to them for that. Having one company offering this many photo tours is not as common as the concept of photo workshops. And again, it's really all about who you know, who you work well with, and what types of places you want to go and what the companies offer. Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense yeah how, how does it work with like approaching the landowners like do you just like knock on their door simply do you like do you call them or send an email like how do you work through and like, i guess break down those barriers so to speak to you yeah. know get those shots so i might not be able to answer this real well because a lot of the tours that do this are not the ones that i that i've actually been a part of so mm -hmm. a lot of it's come from just brian brian going to the area so many times over the years where he's he's got to know people. Some of it is is blunt. He's got stories as blunt as a, a farmer's field was flooded, and he saw that there were greaves on it they wanted to photograph, and he knew the crops weren't going were going to be successful. So he went to the farmer and said, "Hey, if I if I pay you this amount of money, 
um, to use your land, would you permit me and me and my group to go out and do some photography here to get permission from the homeowner, but also to make sure that he understands the benefit of it, that, hey, birders actually are willing to put in some money towards doing this. And so it might, it might be as blunt as knocking on the door. It might be an email. It might be uh, a connection we have, like, oh, I've got a friend out there who has property, and I'm sure he'd let you use it if you contact him. So word of mouth and sometime, sometimes a cold call or two like that. Mm. That's awesome. And uh, w- when you're out on these photo trips, um, are you able to pick up some photos yourself? I mean, obviously you won't be able to shoot quite as much as if you were just solo, but are you able to capture alongside them? Yeah, absolutely. It's Like you said, it's definitely not as many opportunities as if I was out on my own. But at the same time, um, if, it's hard for me to be to be there and to really tell them exactly what the setting's looking like through a camera and what sort of... Um, adjustments I would recommend making to a camera if I'm not looking through a camera myself and seeing it. I have a really good gauge when I'm when I'm just looking around at like what settings I would probably use, but until I'm actually looking through the camera, that's not necessarily the case. If it's something like shorebirds displaying, and a lot of shorebirds come back and display from the same location over and over, once I get them all situated, if I can find a spot behind them or next to them where I'm still getting where I'm still getting something I'm happy with, yeah, absolutely, I'll, I'll have the opportunity to photograph. Um, the only thing I, I just never, I never let myself start until I start seeing them all shoot down. I want to make sure that I'm not looking through my camera and not noticing that one of them are having issues. So I'm always focused on them first, but once I see everyone else is content and, uh, and doing some photography, absolutely I'll, uh, as long as it's not of any detriment to them, I'll be able to do some photography myself. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe tell us a little bit more about the people that actually do these workshops, like uh, maybe their age group or like what kind of level of photography are they skilled at? Um, is it a lot more like hobbyist or is it people that hopefully want to be professional someday? It, there's a lot of variation to that. Um, I would say in general, it's going to be recently retired people who have been into bird photography for a while and we get everything from, I really enjoy doing bird photography and I I like the type of stuff you're doing, so I want to go try to get some of those images. We get a lot of people who are trying to photograph as many species possible, and they'll realize, oh, the next chunk of birds that I'm missing are, are prairie pothole species. So they look up who does photography tours in North Dakota, and then they'll find us that way, and they'll have a specific target list of species that they're after. We do have some people who are, who are younger who are into, into photography, and that's how they want to use like their vacation time from work is to travel on these trips and really it's a lot more of the I don't really want to plan and come up with the logistics and do all the scouting for a trip so I'm just going to pay someone to do that part for me Um, that same mindset applies to a lot of people who really understand their camera and understand photography really well they just want the ease of having a trip planned and laid out for them but then again we do get a lot of people who maybe are new to photography and they want that they want that workshop instruction and that's and that's the reason why they're there so in general, it's going to be recently recently retired people with a with a good understanding of their camera. Like, I would say, very high end hobbyists overall. Awesome. Yeah, and are those what's the group size usually on those tours? So our photography tours are uh, we max out at four participants. Uh, we think that anything. Oh wow! Yeah, we think that anything more than that, you're gonna if if you're doing anything out in the field, if you're if you're set up at a feeder setup. That's one thing. If you're out in the field walking across the tundra in northern Alaska trying to photograph eiders, a lot of our tours have you in the water and waders and everything. And so if you're if you're in any group bigger than that, not only is it harder to manage and harder for everyone to get exactly what they want, but it's a little it, it can be a little too many people um, for the bird's sake as well to have out there. But really, we think four is kind of the sweet spot of people aren't getting in each other's way, people aren't getting in the bird's way. Everyone, people, and birds are kind of happy at that point. So one guide, four participants on those. The birding tours are going to be eight to ten people, though. Got it. That's a good number. Yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for birding too, it's probably good to have people, you know, spotting different birds and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's really cool how you guys have refined that there. Yeah. Um, so kind of kind of switching gears here a little bit. Um, you want to talk a bit about like your your personal photography. Um, I've kind of noticed I've I've followed you for a while now, and you 
you have a distinct style you need <laughs> kind of like clean perches and um really nice portraits of animals so how did you get into that and like uh, what do you look for in the field to capture that so i i think a lot of a lot of my style came from my introduction to photography was um it was a lot more of carrying a camera while I was birding for the sake of documenting rarities. That's kind of why I started, was trying to be a young birder. Um, if you find anything rare, a lot of people might not believe you right away, so I started carrying a camera for that reason alone. And over time, I over time I started to maybe, oh, this, this bird's nice and close, I'll try to take some pictures of it. And then I, I came from a family and friend group that really was not interested in wildlife interested in uh in birds specifically so a lot of them would see my photos or hear my stories and be like what the heck is that i've never heard of that so i started taking more pictures out in the field uh, if i would travel on a vacation or if i would be out of out of my local park just because i wanted to show people like hey here's what's around you and you don't even realize it so because i got into photography as a way i just wanted to kind of show people things um and i wanted to document things i have a very um I would say like a portrait documentation style um, where it's a lot less on the maybe creative lighting type side of things and it's a lot more on the I just want to capture that bird in the best way it is so you kind of understand something about it. Maybe it's the setting that it's in tells you a little bit about the plants that a uh, specific bird likes or maybe it's capturing a breeding behavior in a way that you can look at that and you can know a little bit about that species while still seeing exactly how a field representation of that bird would look. Um, I try to keep colors true to the species as best I can and things like that, which definitely does not um, necessarily lend itself towards like the creative lighting aspect of things. But like you said, I, I've had quite a, people tell me, quite a few people tell me that it's a more distinct style with clean backgrounds, specific perches, that all of your attention gets drawn right onto the bird and you're seeing the bird as you would in a field guide, as you are in the field, um, if you were there with it. And so I think a lot of that also came from um, Brian Zwiebel, who I mentioned was one of the co-owners at Saberwing. He was kind of my bird, or my photography mentor. I, I met him back in 2014, and he continued to share, uh, share constructive criticism, share advice, um, compliments, and everything over the years on my, on my photos. And so I definitely find myself modeling a style more similar to the thing to the way he shoots. So if you look through his work, mm -hmm. you can see it's uh, that's kind of the direction that that I go. So when I'm in the field, I'm looking for how is the bird behaving, trying to pick up on a pattern of where it might be feeding, where it might be going, in a way that that I can kind of predict what it's going to do. I can kind of predict where it's going to be, and rather than following the bird all the time, it's kind of picking a perch where oh the light's hitting this how I want it. Oh, there's not a bunch of sticks and leaves in the background, so it's a nice compressed background. If I keep an eye on that bird and I know which way it's heading, if I'm looking for perches like that, and I'm waiting for it to hit perches like that, then that's um, that's kind of where I'm going to keep the camera aimed. And I think that's because I also find myself just turning around looking at everything else and just birding while I'm waiting, like while I'm spending time with a given uh, potential photo subject. Is I, I kind of pick the branches and I think, okay, if it if it comes near any of these four branches that I'm looking at right now, like those are where I'm going to raise the camera up towards it. So that's kind of what I'm keeping an eye out for. That's a that's a great strategy, really, with uh, you know picking out the branches with the nice perches instead of just simply chasing the bird with your camera or literally chasing it, maybe. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's and also that's really great that you actually got like some mentorship early on in your photography career. Um, so have you found as you kind of like matured your process over the years that you've kind of drifted away from like maybe Brian's style shooting a little bit more and kind of like into your own? Yeah, I certain I certainly feel like I, I have. Um, one of the styles that I really got into um, for a while, and I, st I still do it a fair bit, was I really got into uh, trying to shoot headshots of species and shoot close-up portraits. And I think that comes from me having a portrait and wedding photography background as well that... Um, I want that like real up close personal look that you might not get to normally see with the bird if you're looking at it just as like a, a headshot maybe composed and cropped in a way that you would like a, a human portrait. Um, that's kind of been one of the styles that I go for. I find myself now starting to really focus a lot more on the setting 
of of the photo than I ever did before. So I'm more concerned of I want you to be able to look at look at the species and know, oh, maybe this is how this is the types of plants this bird likes to be in. This is the where they typically like to feed to so something like a Kentucky warbler. I don't necessarily want up on a up on a high perch if I can get it down on a mossy log or something because they like to feed lower in the area that I'm at. Things like that are how are kind of the style I find myself going for a lot more rather than just strictly staying with that that documentation style that still is going to be uh, be in there at some in some capacity in most of the images that I do. A lot more capturing action, capturing behavior than I ever did before um, due to the setup I'm doing now, trying to capture uh, quick motion and everything. And when you're when you're doing these um, kind of the perch shots, are you still using a telephoto lens or are you going more wide angle, kind of waiting for the birds or so I, what's your process there? I'm, I'm still using a, using telephoto and I think that's because the the background is still like such the compressed background is still such a part of what I like so much of like a, in in the style that I go for and so I would love to shoot the wide angle and I know there's some people out there who just have some just mind blowing wide angle songbird photography I've been seeing some more of that recently and it, it just mm-hmm. I, I find myself staring at it for minutes and minutes on end staring at these photos but for me personally I still find myself using that 500 millimeters. As compressed as I can get that background is uh, is my personal style of what I like to shoot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's for sure. That uh, the wide angles, you know, cool, but it's incredibly hard to capture. And yeah. sometimes, like, uh, you really have to be careful on your background too. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, compression is definitely uh, good. But w- what I really like about your photos too, it's. Um, you know, it's not like it's a blue sky background. You, you seem to always get to eye level, uh, which is great. You know, that's that really creates uh, creative images. So will you, uh, you know, will you lay low? Will you try to get elevation? Like, do you, do you specifically seek that out? Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I definitely always try to seek out that eye level. I think, I think that, um, I think that that is what kind of creates a more personable uh, experience with the bird. Again, it's maybe thinking of some of these warblers as high canopy feeders, but when you have opportunities to see them down low, you see them for something different uh, than you might normally see them. And and then again, that's kind of sharing people who, sharing that with people who may not normally see them like that, kind of giving them an idea of what's around them and everything. I I like that personal uh, look. If it's, if it's a ground dwelling species, I'll be on my stomach laying down waiting for it to be there if it's if it's a high canopy species i find myself liking to photograph in areas where maybe there's some steep hillsides i can go up higher up the hillside and i know i'll be closer to um that i'll be closer to that canopy on some of the trees that are maybe further down the hillside things like southern ohio getting into central kentucky you really get a lot of that terrain where you can go out and photograph some of these high canopy species um, at more of an eye level area yeah, definitely. Yeah, personable is a great way to put it too, because it does just feel like you almost in a way have much much better connection with it. It just feels like there's a lot more effort put into the photograph there. Um, so you mentioned the about the region here. So I'm not sure how many people that are non-birders really realize, but like the Midwest is pretty great for birding. Um, so what are some like reliable locations like to visit in this area, and why is it you know important area to go bird watching yeah. at? So the, the Midwest is not only great just due to uh... It's really due to so many things. If you're on the western end of the Midwest, you start having remnants of the Great of the Great Plains there, which are going to provide some excellent species. If you're in the southeastern part of the Great Plains, you have the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, which are going to provide an entirely different habitat. If you're up on the north end, you're up in the Great Lakes region, and a lot of the marshes in the Great Lakes region are incredible stopover sites during migration, which can create some fantastic opportunities. So really, you're not too far away from hitting so many different habitats. And Ohio specifically is really nice. And I know Indiana and Illinois get this too, but I can, I can speak to Ohio just because that's where I live. That when I'm in southern Ohio, I'm a 15-minute drive right now from an area where Kentucky warblers and hooded warblers and prairie warblers and prothonotary warblers are very common birds. I can drive... 30, 40 minutes and be in an area where ceruleans and worm-eating warblers can be very 
easy easy to find species. And then all all it is for me is a three and a half hour drive, and I'm up at McGee Marsh, where thirty six warbler species are passing through that little area in the course of a week or two during the biggest week festival. So really, this area is not only a major uh, breeding grounds for a lot of these southern species, but it's an incredibly important stopover habitat for a lot of the migrants as they're doing their last leg of their journey before heading up into the boreal forest uh, for the nesting season. So you can find a lot of them concentrated along the lakefront woodlots and marshes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that they're also biggest week. Um, you've had a presence there for a while now, uh, for years, I believe. Um, tell people more about that festival in general and what it's about. Yeah, so the biggest week in American birding is a festival held in Oak Harbor, Ohio. It's about 50 minutes uh, east of Toledo, Ohio, right in the McGee Marsh Wildlife Area region. And so the whole the festival is going to span as far as uh, the Oak Openings region, which is on the west side of Toledo, all the way to Sandusky, which is going to be in the central part, the central basin of Lake Erie on the north shore of Ohio. And this festival is all about capturing the migration spectacle that comes through the Great Lakes region. The marshes and um, swamps that are right in the area that are remnants of the, of the historic Great Black Swamp, which used to cover seven counties in northwest Ohio, is a major stopover place for these uh, songbirds, like I mentioned. A lot of them are coming from Central South America. They're going to jump across the Gulf of Mexico, spend some time in uh, the Gulf Coast, kind of recovering from that journey, work their way up, and they're going to hit the Great Lakes, and they're going to think, oh, well, I just did this down in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't want to do this again. I'm going to spend some time fueling up before I make this jump. And so you can find these large concentrations of birds in this area. And oftentimes they're so focused on feeding and they're so concentrated that you'll have some of these high canopy warbler species down at your feet or down at eye level or landing on the boardwalk at McGee with you. So this festival brings people from all 50 states and I think the last... The last festival brought people in from 35 countries, if I'm not mistaken. Um, wow. wow. All of that is gathered around witnessing, um, witnessing spring songbird migration and starting off the morning with a chorus of warblers singing and ending the day with woodcocks and whippoorwills. It really is an incredible, incredible 10-day event that uh, I highly recommend everyone be part of. The area is kind of, it's notorious for how incredibly crowded it gets for birders. But over the years, there's a lot more metro parks and public lands are being opened along the lakefront. Birders are really being distributed across the whole area. And so the overall density of people is not what it used to be in the area. So if you're hesitant of the crowds, it's really not that way anymore. Or it's, it's certainly going away from that. Yeah, and like you said, there's plenty of alternatives to that main boardwalk for sure. Um, and then talk a little bit about your involvement in Biggest Week. Are you running tours there? Or are you what's, what's your role there? <laughs> so this year my role was kind of a little bit of everything. In years past, I have I started off going to the Biggest Week as a participant, and then right about my junior, senior year of high school, I started leading field trips. Um, biggest Week runs uh, 10 to 12 van trips every day, and then another 5 or 6 meet-on-site guided bird walks, and so I would lead trips for them for that, as well as, uh, as well as just helping out in any way they needed me as a volunteer. I would, I would speak and present. Then, as I uh, joined Sabre Wing, I now represent Sabre Wing at the festival, so a lot of the tour companies have these contracts there, so I guide for the festival as part of my contract with Sabre, or as part of Sabre Wing's contract with the festival. But when I'm not doing that, then I'm, I'm usually with with clients up in the area, whether it's birding or photography up in that region, uh, on my days off from the festival, or uh, I'm leading a tour in the area just before or after the festival. And most recently this year, I was actually one of the two field trip coordinators for the entire festival. So every year my, my involvement gets deeper and deeper with the event, and I'm branching out and helping them with a lot of the planning aspects that are extending beyond the scope of field trips now. Yeah, that's awesome, and you did a great job for sure. Oh, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, and I, I definitely suggest for any birders, listeners out there, or even interested in birding, make sure you check it out. I mean, it's just very inclusive, and uh, you'll meet tons of people. I mean, I just I found myself talking on the boardwalk for hours just with yeah. random people. 
mm-hmm. um, it's it's amazing for sure. It, it's so, definitely yeah, a thanks giant. Thanks again for that. Yeah, it definitely feels like a a giant party. I mean, it, just to see that many people there, all knowing that they're there for the same reason you are, just to enjoy birds. Um, I always joke with people that everyone there is a friend until proven otherwise, because anyone will stop and <laughs> happily talk to you about what they're seeing and everything. And it's always great. I mean, like you said, people you meet, it's it's amazing the not only the networking opportunities you could get there and the connections you'll make, the friends you get to catch up with, the friends you get to make. It's really an awesome time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, sure. that sense of community is just like none else. I mean, a lot of people, I imagine, go for birding solitary in like a solitary way. But like with that, it's just like it's it's almost more fun, you know, because you get to share the it enjoyment is. and the experiment, yeah. experience of like, you know, seeing the new species and all that stuff. Yeah, and the, the rush of seeing a whole group finding a rare bird and getting to see a rare bird together is really cool. I'm fortunate enough with Saberwing to travel to many different bird festivals and represent us at those events. But there's really nothing that has that has the feel like the biggest week does. Yeah, what are some of those like really cool like birds or what what are like some of the best finds you may find up at Biggest Week in terms of birds? Oh goodness. In terms of Biggest Week, I mean part of the fun with spring migration is you never know. But really, a lot of the highlights of the area is that, I mean, the area typically ends up with close to 250 species during the week. We have some cool species that are breeding there as remnants of um, the great black swamp that are now starting to come back to the area now that now that a lot of habitat restoration is going on, and it's going on at a very quick rate. So things like black neck stilt, yellow-headed blackbird, Wilson's fowler, we're going to breed there. But really, the main thing that this festival boasts is that every every festival uh, actually the most recent couple of years it's been all 36 warbler species that pass through Ohio pass through during the biggest week in American birding festival so it's an enormous list of warblers that you can find uh, during your time there and it's it's a lot more about how not only just how many species there are but how well you get to see them how low these species are feeding the opportunities you have to see these birds that normally would have you straining your neck looking up in the canopy of mature forests are sitting at your feet or sitting on this boardwalk or are catching bugs right in front of your face and they're they're too close for a camera to focus on. So it's really it's really amazing for that, for those warblers, for six six vireo species, all the flycatchers that come through Ohio, the waterfowl migrants are still uh, still lingering in the area, so you can get quite a good duck diversity. The shorebirds that pass through the area. There's some raptor migration still. The blue jay flights are one of my favorite spectacle of the area. Where, oh my gosh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this year we had Crazy. we had good blue jay flights every single day of the festival. And good flights are being. I had I had multiple 2,000 plus mornings of blue jays. Um, yeah. So I mean, at Mommy Bay especially, I found that was crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mommy Bay is a great place for it. La- last year, I had a I had an eighteen thousand blue jay morning there. It, oh, wow. it 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 can the the whole spectacle of what you're seeing is really greater than any given species that you could target there. Just getting to see the sheer numbers of species come through. Uh, mm-hmm. and we had that in the middle of the festival this year, where just numbers I've never seen before of bay-breasted warbler coming through the area. And chest and side of warbler. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. Yeah, definitely. And like you mentioned with warblers, a lot of them are high canopy birds, but like seeing them up close and eye level just I feel like for a lot of people, especially starting out with birding, just like really, really helps them see them up close, you know, kinda like get the behavior and, you know, get a photo as a result too. Yeah. It's a great way to learn them. You get to learn the song because they're right in front of you. You can see them singing. Like yeah. so you pick yeah. up on behavior, you pick up on little field marks you might not normally know and then when you're back out in the field and you're looking at them in a more typical if you will um, setting then it really you get to use a lot of that information and it really helps sharpen your ID skills on warblers getting to see them that well that many times and for so long yeah definitely and it increases your life list of two which is always great oh, oh absolutely yeah yeah so uh, yeah switching gears here a little bit um it's a little bit more of a philosophical question maybe but like how important is like storytelling with your images like do you are you really concerned about conservation um both in your own photography or in the photo tours or even both yeah i i mean that's absolutely a huge thing i mean again like i like i said part of why i got into photography and part of why i started using it as more of an art form if anything was 
because I wanted to share, I wanted to open people's eyes to what was around them they might not know. How how can people care care about protecting something they don't know exists? So if people who might not be into nature, they don't realize how many species of birds come through the area. They see cardinals and robins every day, but if they don't know that there's 300 something species that come through Ohio in a, in a given year, or they don't realize that all these warblers pass through this area, why are they going to care when it comes time to conserve habitat if the birds they see every day are doing just fine, they still see them every day, because there's a lot more to it than we realize. And so I, conservation's huge, and that's a lot of why I want to, uh, like why I like sharing my images with non-birders and non-photographers. It's why I spend a lot of time and I donate my images to organizations like Black Swamp Bird Observatory to use for things like promotion with projects that they're working on or the biggest week festival. Things like that. With Sabrewing, we're really big on making sure that we're using, if we're out of country, we're working with local guides and we're using, we're always, if it's U.S. or abroad, we're, we're trying to impact the local economy as much as we can with where we're staying and what we're eating and what we're doing and the places we're going in a way that we want people to realize the financial power that the birders and uh, bird photographers can have on an area and the impact and the benefit of preserving it for that reason. So that's a huge part of why I photograph and why I share why I share my photographs is I hope I hope to be able to open people's eyes and give them something give them a reason to care about birds. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so what is, what's kind of on your radar now? Like what are, what are some of your goals um, with your birding and photography and just business in general in the next couple of years? Yeah. So I, I'm hoping to get a lot more, I mean, as, as the travel industry is really starting to open up quickly again, following, uh, following the pandemic and people are, people are tired of being cooped up and they're ready to get out and get out and get back to traveling. Um, continuing to get, to get busier, um, have, getting the opportunity to go spend more time with more people in the field showing them birds and teaching them bird photography for my own photography I'm hoping to kind of diversify the locations that I've photographed um, being able to use my being able to use my photos for things like Saber Wings promotion for our social media for our website kind of gives me a new sense of motivation for photographing certain species because if we're trying to advertise a tour to whatever location we want good photos of those species to be able to, to use for advertisement reasons. So that's a good motivation for me to be out working on those species. I really am trying to, I'm really trying to spend more time in the field doing photography because I feel like it's a great way that I learn, I get to really learn the behavior of a species well, and that's going to translate really well into leading birding tours because I've spent 20, 30 minutes with a given warbler right in front of me, so I understand that bird a lot better. I I've picked up on little behavior things and audio and everything that will be beneficial to me in other aspects. Um, all that on top of, I, I really am, my personal goal is to learn and photograph the tropics a lot better than I have. I've not really had a ton of opportunities to do so in, until this past fall and really took advantage of that opportunity. I was very happy with, very happy with the work that came out of uh, my trip to Panama. Colombia, unfortunately, was the, uh, what my camera met an unfortunate end pretty early into that trip and so oh, I, didn't no. get, I didn't get to do a whole lot of photography on that trip uh, when the lens mount got bent and the lens wouldn't fit on the camera anymore yeah. so it was devastating oh, yikes. but um, just I really want the so, opportunity uh, was to the, you, did you have a I was just going to ask about that uh, the camera did you have a long lens and it, it bent it is that what happened so, so what had happened was it was really a uh, it was awful. I was on. We were in a dugout canoe in the Amazon rainforest, and I was standing up to get off the boat, and I had a life jacket, camera, and binoculars all around my neck. And so, with the life jacket on, I wasn't really feeling the strap on my neck, so I assumed that they were both on well. And the camera slid off, and it landed right, mm. right where the body and lens meet. Is like, right what hit, oh, hit gosh. one of the little <laughs> steps. The lens was completely fine. And all the force got taken onto that little $15 piece of metal that uh, that lines your camera mount. So the mount itself wasn't damaged. Mm. It was just a little metal ring around it. Uh, got bent, but it got bent in a way that the lens couldn't go back on. So oh, no. 
So the camera itself was not actually uh, was not actually damaged really, um, other than some scratches and dings, and then that obviously that part was broken. Um, and the lens thankfully suffered no no issues, so I was able to actually go back and repair the camera. The lens is still good, so all all the gears back in working order after that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah so you're you're shooting on F zero zero for a while. <laughs> yeah, that, yep. That horrible yeah, number. <laughs> yeah. Yep. My uh, my poor five hundred millimeter was nothing more than like a a little like uh-huh. spotting scope. <laughs> hey, I mean, I, at least at least it wasn't the lens though, because I, I would I guess know. that's you know massively more expensive than the body. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's good yeah, there. Yeah. And it was a it was a new lens to me, so I was really gonna be upset if something had happened to it. <laughs> of course, yes. yeah, yeah. So that that early on in the trips, I mean, like, did you have a backup camera, or were you, like, what did you I, do after that? So I did. I ended up, I ended up taking a day, a couple days where we were gonna be in really really dark areas. And I knew my backup camera. It I have the uh, my backup camera was the Z6, which the Z6 doesn't have any sort of like tracking to it, so the autofocus is already a little bit slower without that tracking um, feature. Plus, I was we were hiking really long days. It was a birding trip specifically, so we were doing some long hikes trying for a lot of the harder target species of the area. Um, so I I decided just for my own reasons to just take a few days and just just use binoculars um but later on in the trip i i started taking the back of camera out and ended up getting some getting some stuff i was pretty happy with later in the trip okay yeah that's awesome at least some silver lining to it i guess though <laughs> yeah definitely and, and it was still an all-around great trip like i as soon as i realized that the camera itself wasn't ruined and the lens was fine then the only thing that was bothering me was just that i didn't have a camera with it wasn't that my cam. I, I didn't have to go the whole trip worrying if my camera was destroyed. I at least had that sort of confidence that it was. So that was nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So maybe uh, talk a little bit more about. Do you use like eBird or other kinds of apps? Uh, what are uh, some like other tips or advice you give to like birders to um, improve their experience? Really. Yeah. I. So I. I'm big about eBird. I always have been. Um, like I mentioned, birding was a collection to me and ebird is a way to ebird's a way to uh kind of keep track of all that so not only is it a good way for me to i I really like the numbers i really like the listing side of birding as well i think it uh i think it keeps you sharp it keeps you out it keeps you exploring new places it keeps uh it keeps the it keeps the common birds exciting to you if every time you're out you're trying to see as many birds as possible then suddenly those cardinals and robins are, you, you got to make sure you're paying attention to those when you're out and everything. So, so I'm all about that. Ebirds uh, or Cornell's Merlin app is a great reference to keep, to keep images, to study a species, to get to learn uh, the ranges, but really it's a great tool for, uh, for keeping a bunch of songs. I'm not a huge fan of it's getting better. Their audio recording, their audio identification tool still has, still has a ways to go in terms of accuracy. But I do think that's a great way to to get out and to learn to kind of learn the bird songs around you, as long as you're validating it. But right. um, mm-hmm. just one thing that at least has translated really well into bird photography for me has just been all of my experience in just being a birder. I mean, the amount of time I've spent out in the field with certain species, when I go to photograph them, then suddenly a warbler is not this high, this high canopy, super bouncy bird. Like, I have, I have years and years and years of experience with that species. I know what types of areas they like to feed in. I know what types of plants they like. I know where they like to, to nest. So what sort of habitat I should be in. I know how they behave. I know what which species are going to be feeding lower, which ones I need to try to find areas where I can get that better vantage point on them. So I think just repetition in the field, uh, even if it doesn't involve having a camera with you, that's going to eventually pay off in really understanding your subjects well and really going to help you photograph them even better. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend, like, if someone is a birder and a photographer, do you recommend sometimes going out with just the binoculars and just using that exclusively? That's, 
I do because that's what I do, and I really enjoy it. If I'm, I'm not really, I used to be, and I've certainly become less of that birder that carries the camera with them. And sure, for every, for every time I'm out, there's an opportunity or two that I really regret not having my camera there for me. Um, but at the same time, getting to really just force myself to spend that time just learning, then when I know, when I know I can go back. And I can focus more on the setting and the lighting and perches and background and everything. If I can focus more on that, then trying to understand my subject is a lot less big of a part of it because I'll have that experience. And I can kind of focus on the aspects of the photography that I want. And then suddenly the bird is just one more component into that as well, or as opposed to it being this sporadic, unpredictable aspect. Right, definitely, I spend, yeah. Yeah, I definitely spend a lot more time out with just the binoculars on my day-to-day. And then uh, mm-hmm. once I kind of go out, I'll bird an area a few times, kind of get an understanding of what species are there and what, how they're behaving. Maybe I'll find a specific bird, um, specific individual that maybe has a territory closer to the roadside or likes to feed closer to the side of the trail. And I can go back in multiple times and kind of validate this. So then I have a better idea when I go out to the field uh, for that. Do you go as far as finding specific perches at those locations too? Um, I wouldn't. I might keep an eye out. Um, I might keep an eye out when I'm out birding, but a lot of times I kind of save that for the day of. I, cause I have to consider mm-hmm. what's the cloud cover looking like, what's the light looking like, um, or if I'm doing things with waterfowl, what's the wind like. So... It, it's easy when you're out in the field just birding to to think of all these amazing perches and then you actually get out there with the camera and the light's not exactly how you want. So it can be a little mm-hmm. hard to predict. But I've got spots where I'll yeah. go birding and I'll see, oh, this prairie warbler really likes to sit at the top of this cedar tree. And I'll go back multiple times and he'll always be there. And then maybe I'll spend some time while I'm out birding thinking, oh, if I walk off trail just 10 feet this way, now, in the morning, the sun would be at my back here. I'm up higher up the hill from them, so I'm right at eye level with them. Yeah, I should come back and do this, and then I'll go back and do that later. Yeah. So are you always shooting in those more sunny conditions, light-wise, or what do you look for there? I certainly like to shoot uh, I like to shoot sunny conditions when it's early in the morning. I, in the spring, summertime, I don't really find myself shooting too far past 9 o'clock in the mornings here. Um, unless I'm back in the woods and I've got that shade cover, I much, I much prefer an even light source. Uh, so if it's a nice flat or if it's a nice low, golden light in the morning that's gonna light up my subject nice and evenly, that's what I want. But if I'm, but if in order to do that on a species, if I'm out a little later than I wanted, and I can get some cloud cover and kind of keep a nice uniform. Uh, consistent lighting across the image that's kind of my style mm-hmm. Got it. yeah that's 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 um it's definitely a, a great way to do the kind of documentary style for sure yeah. because you're not really obscuring any details or um leaving out any elements so i mm-hmm. think that's awesome mm-hmm. yeah definitely awesome so as we wrap up the show here tyler uh, is there any big photo trips you got planned um any shout outs or anything you want to plug from Save yeah. yeah so I I'm actually heading heading up to northern Alaska Sunday for a for a photography tour it's actually a private private guiding with with a client or two up there so that'll just be a, a quick time spending some time with shorebird breeding and uh, an eider photography but a lot of uh, a lot of the photo tours that I do are going to be actually in the springtime so I do I do a warbler photo workshops where I focus a lot on the southern breeders in the area, as well as I do warbler photo workshops up in the boreal forest, trying to target a lot of the species that breed up there. But yeah, if, I mean, if, if it's something that sounds interesting to you, I I recommend checking out Saberwing's website. There's a lot of we have a lot of uh, a lot of locations that we cover, and all of our guides are very well versed in the areas that they're leading. Awesome. I just want to thank you guys good. again for having me here. Yeah, of course. Thank you. It's been really interesting. We've never really had a um, a birding specific tour guide on here, and a, oh, cool. a you know it's really great photography knowledge too. So we really appreciate it. 
Yeah, and where, where's the best place Thank for you. listeners to go uh, connect with you and see more of your work? Yeah. So, yeah, Saber Wings website would be the best place. Or I'm uh, on Instagram. It's at Warrior Creative. It's Warrior underscore Creative. All right. Tyler Ficker, awesome. it's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you guys so much.